Well, good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you this morning. Please turn in your New Testaments to James chapter 3. We will get started with that text here in just a few moments. I want to start with a word of thanks to, first of all, the elders for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you this morning, and to Brother Lee for giving up the pulpit for a Sunday morning and let Brother Estes and I have uh, a chance to speak to you all. He did a wonderful job, a great lesson on how are our listening ears and making sure that we're listening. Second, I want to thank you all for being here. Whether you're a visitor with us or you're one of our regular members, your presence here is greatly appreciated. It, it shows that you have a desire to study God's Word, to see what it has to say to us, and to associate with the saints here. And I hope that everything that I present to you this morning will be encouraging and uplifting, and most importantly, from God's Word. On the campus of Brigham Young University, there is a painting of a 16th century sailing ship, much like this one. And the ships are, the sails are tied to the mast. It is safely anchored in the harbor. And at the bottom of that painting, there's an inscription that says, a ship is safe in the harbor, but that's not what ships are for. You see, ships are not built for sitting in the harbor or in the dry dock where they're built or repaired. They're built to navigate the oceans. They're in the case of many ships, built to provide both offense and defense. These mighty ships are not made to be permanently anchored somewhere. They were built for a purpose. They were built to be used, to be strong, to experience tests and different trials. We were built for that same purpose. Not to sit safely in our homes and our church buildings, sheltered from the world and temptation, we were made in the image of Almighty God to suit His purposes, to serve Him and each other. We were made for more than just living and dying. We were made for offense, for defense, to care for others, to constantly watch out for ourselves, and to study and improve ourselves for God's glory and God's purposes. So this morning, I want to talk to you about ships. But before we get into the heart of the lesson, let's take a look at what the Bible has to say in James chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles open, let's read James chapter 3, and we'll notice verses 4 and 5. James chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, and just as a side note, I read from the ESV. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Now on the screen behind me, momentarily, are four ships. The one on the top left is the USS Missouri, Mighty Mo. It was the most fearsome battleship in the United States Navy serving with distinction from her launch on January 29, 1944, to her final operations during Operation Desert Storm in 1991. She was decommissioned on March 31, 1992, and is currently berthed in the historic waters of Pearl Harbor. Some of you may have been there. As the centerpiece of the Battleship Missouri Memorial in Pearl Harbor, just across from the USS Arizona. The ship on the top right is the aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan. It was commissioned on July 12, 2003 and is the ninth Nimitz-class nuclear-powered carrier in the U.S. Naval Fleet. At the time her keel was laid down, the USS Ronald Reagan was the first nuclear-powered warship to be named in honor of a living former president. The ship on the bottom left is a cargo ship. The Maersk cargo ship, the Emma Maersk, is one of the largest of its kind in the world. It cost $145 million to build. It's just over 1,300 feet long and can carry over 11,000 cargo containers. It's almost 100 feet from the deck to the keel. She can travel over 29 miles per hour and can be crewed by only 13 people. The fourth ship, the Stennis Superior, is a crude oil tanker. It was built in 2011, has a length of nearly 900 feet, can carry just over a million barrels of oil, and is based out of Houston, Texas. Now, why would I take the time to go over all that information on these ships? Because it directly relates to what I want to talk to you about this morning. 
All of these ships were built in a dry dock or in a harbor. They oftentimes begin and end their journey in a harbor. But that's not what they were made for. They were each made for a purpose. Some were built for war, for transporting goods internationally, for shipping oil. But they all have a purpose. They weren't meant to stay in that harbor. They were built to go out on the high seas, endure treacherous conditions, incredibly long journeys, some with the possibility of being damaged or even destroyed. But that is their purpose. We've already read a little bit about what James has to say about ships and rudders and how a ship's rudder is similar to our tongue. This is a picture of the U.S. aircraft carrier, the USS Theodore Roosevelt. This is the last ship, I promise. The Teddy Roosevelt cost about four and a half billion, with a B, dollars. It weighs over 97,000 tons. It's 1,092 feet long. That's nearly as long as the Empire State Building is tall. It carries a crew of over 5,600, carries over 80 aircraft, enough food to serve 18,000 meals a day for three months. It can turn 400,000 gallons of salt water to fresh water a day. And it's steered by two rudders that are each 29 feet tall by 22 feet and weigh 50 tons each. Just like the rudders of the USS Roosevelt, our tongue is a very small part of our bodies. Granted, the rudders of the Roosevelt are huge, but they're quite small compared to the incredible size and weight of the ship. Our tongues are vitally important for communication, for navigating the difficult waters of life, and just like that ship's rudder, they can be used to steer us in the right direction or the wrong direction. The USS Teddy Roosevelt is nuclear-powered. It can feed thousands of people a day, launch multiple aircraft simultaneously, can carry out operations 24 hours a day. But that amazing piece of military technology is a $4.5 billion raft without its two functioning rudders. Just like that inscription on the painting, a ship is safe in the harbor, but that's not what ships are for. That same statement applies to us as Christians. Ships are for sailing, not harbors. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that's great, but what do you mean by that? And that question is how we're going to take up the rest of our time this morning. So before we talk about what this means for Christians, let's talk a little bit about what this meant for the apostles in the first century, the first century Christians. Well, first of all, they were selected, the apostles, and trained by Jesus in Matthew chapter 10. They were warned about what was to come, whether it was persecution or even death. Eventually, it was time to, for them to launch, to battle, to navigate, to overcome. After Jesus' ascension in Acts chapter 1 and 2, he was no longer with them, and they had to do it on their own. They battled with offense, preaching the gospel, with defense, resisting the attacks of the devil, assisting the saints in caring for one another and practicing servant leadership. And just like that very first song, I don't know if Kevin knew this is what I was preaching on, but that very first song was perfect. They had an anchor, and their anchor was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, the, the sermon there that was preached on the day of Pentecost. And we'll read beginning in verse 22. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would 
set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. That was their anchor. That was where they placed their faith. They were there. They saw it happen. And one more passage. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, and we'll read verses 19 and 20. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It even uses the word anchor in that passage. That was what the apostles and the early Christians relied on. And speaking of the early Christians, what what kind of did the harbor mean for them? Well, the early church started off in fairly calm waters. Turn over to Acts chapter 2. We'll read there at the end of the account of the Sermon on the Mount and kind of get an idea of what the church was like in those few days and weeks after this historic sermon. Acts chapter 2, and let's read verses 46 and 47. Acts 2, beginning in verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. They were glad, they rejoiced, and they had great favor among each other. But we know later on storms would come. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are jailed. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen would be stoned to death. And in Acts chapter 8, we find Saul who would later become the Apostle Paul, persecuting the church in Jerusalem. Well, these saints had to launch. They had to go and they had to do. They weren't built for the safe harbor of staying in their homes and staying just amongst themselves. The saints in Acts chapter 8 did this, and so did the saints in Acts chapter 17. Well, what was their anchor? It was the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 8, verses 4 doesn't tell us that they all shut up in their homes and hid out and went underground. It says, Acts chapter 8, verse 4, those who were scattered went about preaching the word, even in the midst of the persecution by Saul and others. Well, what does this mean when we talk about this harbor as it relates to us as Christians? What we mean is that we, we start our lives as human beings and Christians in three different areas. And the first one is with familiar people. We spend our time, a, a lot of our time, around our family, around our church family here, around coworkers, employees, their friends, our relatives, our neighbors. We also have a lot of familiar surroundings, whether it's going to home or church or work or school. We have a lot of familiar situations. Again, home and church and and going to and from those places, being in and around and living around our neighborhood, going to different stores, to the mall, to work, to movies, and those kind of things, or even on vacation. We begin our lives and our walk with God in and around people we know, we care about, and they care about us. We spend our time in and around places that are safe and comfortable. And even though we spend a great deal of time growing and learning and living in that safe harbor of our lives, we know that ultimately we're not going to stay in that sheltered environment. As parents and grandparents, we know that our children or grandchildren will leave this safe harbor that we have for them, whether it's a school or job or college or the military or just moving. We realize that we or our children will leave the harbor and venture out into the world. Just like a ship that's been built, that ship has a purpose. And that purpose is not to remain in the dry dock or the harbor. Just like those giant ships we looked at earlier, we are built to go and to do. Well, what are these different ships that we looked at earlier built for? And let's, let's kind of make some comparisons to us. 
Well, it kind of depends on the overall purpose of the ship. It could be a hospital ship designed to care for the sick. It could be a warship. It could be a Coast Guard rescue ship. It could be designed for oil or shipping containers. But here's some of the possibilities I'd like to discuss with you this morning, and there's some pretty incredible similarities to how we compare to those ships, believe it or not. So the first one is offense. And a lot of times we, we see those airplanes or those missiles or those big guns or all of those different things and even the, the helicopters and soldiers that are on those ships. They're built to go out and take care of things. Well, they're also built for defense. Uh, my son Hunter and I were very fortunate to go with a group. I don't know if any of you have been. If you have, it's amazing and I recommend going. Down in Corpus Christi, Texas, there is the USS Lexington. Aircraft carrier, it's eight or 900 feet long. And it was amazing to walk through all of the different parts of that ship and, and see what all they carry on board that ship, especially on the, the defense side. Because, yes, they have the, the different guns and rockets and ships and parts and things like that, but they had, they had so much more. They dealt with the repair of the ship, too. They had spare parts and replacement parts. They even had an area probably the size of this area here that was a metal shop. If they had, if a part broke, they could make a part to go fit into some part of the ship. They had the different tools that you would need. They even had a fire department. One of the other amazing things, if you, I highly recommend you go uh, because a ship oftentimes deals with the care of the crew as well. They had doctor's offices, they had an infirmary. They had doctors, nurses, and it was really neat to see on the Lexington, they had a couple of dentist offices too. In addition to that, they had obviously the mess hall where we got to eat meals, they had laundry, and they even had a barber shop. Well, one of the other things that the ship is built for in many cases is for cargo. Now that may be carrying cargo that the troops are gonna need or those 11,000 shipping containers. But they carry a lot of different things on board that ship, and that's what those ships are built for. They have storage areas and storerooms to, to store those things because it's all for the care of those on the ship or for the ship itself. Well, similarly, what are we built for? We're built for offense as well. Turn over to Matthew chapter 28, a very well-known passage to many of us. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. This is after the resurrection of our Lord, and he gives this great commission to his disciples. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Great Commission in this section of verses was exactly that. It was a commission. It was not the great suggestion. We have to go on offense. We have to go. The very first word in verse 19 is the word go. The Great Commission was given to the apostles, but I believe that we should have the same mindset and go. Turn over to Colossians chapter 3, and we'll look at one verse over there. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. We are not only to let God's word dwell in us, but we're to teach, we're to admonish one another and sing. Those are all active words. Those are all actions, activities that we need to participate in. They involve being on a certain amount of offense. Well, we are also built for defense. Turn to Philippians chapter 1 and we'll read a few verses there. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 15 beginning. Philippians 1.15 some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. 
The former proclaimed Christ out of rivalry, but not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. We're not only to let God's Word dwell in us. That was the other point. While Paul was appointed by Christ to defend the gospel, let us also have the mindset to always be ready to defend the truth. Turn over to 1 Peter, the third chapter, and verse 15. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. The first part of Peter's exhortation in this verse is the part that most people quote, but they forget the important second part. We need to study the Word and make sure that we're prepared to make a defense of our hope. That much is definitely true. But we need to make sure that we make that defense with gentleness and with respect. One of the things that we're also built for is care of others. Turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and we'll read verse 10. Romans 12 and verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Paul encourages the Romans and us today to show one of the marks of a true Christian, and that is showing brotherly affection. Turn now over to 1 Corinthians, just a few pages over, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, also verse 10. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and with the same judgment. Unity among brethren shows care for one another. We may have minor disagreements here and there, but we have to be united as a congregation, having the same mind. We're also built for service. Turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 26. John 12 and verse 26. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. One of our key functions as Christians is to serve serving our neighbors, serving our brethren, serving our local congregation. Ultimately, we serve God, and we can do so by serving one another. Turn back to Romans chapter 12, and we're going to read verse 11. Romans 12 and verse 11. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit serve the Lord. As we read previously in chapter 12, there are several marks of a true Christian, and another one of these marks of a true Christian is to serve. One of the final things that I want to go over this morning is we're built for self-improvement. Turn over to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Matthew, chapter 6, and we're going to read verse 33. Matthew 6, Verse 33, probably one of the more well-known passages uh, to many people. Matthew 6 and verse 33, it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. This passage clearly tells us that we are to seek God's kingdom and His righteousness. And that means activity on our part. We can't read this passage and interpret it any other way than we are to seek we are to go. We are to do. That means work on our part. That means hard work, difficult work, reading God's Word, associating with His people, assembling with one another every time we are able to, and living out the teachings of Jesus 
in our lives as an example. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. It's our final passage this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 22. Ephesians 4, 22. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. I think this passage is even more clear than Matthew 6.33. We are to put off our old lives, to renew ourselves, and to put on our new lives in Christ. We were created in the image of God, and we must fashion ourselves in His likeness. That requires action on our part. It requires hard, consistent, daily work. Christianity is not about staying in the safe harbor. It's about active lives, active evangelism. It's about humbly and powerfully defending God's Word. It's about active and faithful participation in our local congregation. It's about fighting for our families and bringing up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Our goal is heaven, and we can't get there by staying in a safe harbor. We have to get out there in the world, but not of the world, as the saying goes. That's what we were built for. And even more importantly, that's what we're commanded to do. I have a few final thoughts in closing. This is a 16th century sailing ship, obviously with its sails tied, sitting in the calm water of the harbor. And just like this ship, Noah and his family left the safe harbor of their daily lives. They built an ark, and they lived on it while it rained for 40 days and nights. He was able to endure not only building that ark, but preaching and subsequent persecution by those outside his family by having an anchor in God. King David was a shepherd boy, not a soldier. He was in a safe harbor, but he left the security of that harbor, armed with faith and courage, and he defeated Goliath. David acknowledges in so many Old Testament passages how much he depended on God, his shelter, his strength, and his power, because God was David's anchor. There are countless stories of early pioneers in this country who left the safety and security of their homes, their communities, and lands to travel west. Many of us in this very room left the safe, safe harbor of our home state to go to college, to take a job, or maybe even take a vacation to Texas where they met their wife. Jesus left the safety of heaven, his heavenly father, his earthly parents. He left the relative safety of his home and his community. He left the safety of that upper room that night and went to Gethsemane to pray and later be betrayed. He endured temptation. He endured the daily pains of living as a man in a sinful world and the horrific pain of betrayal and the crucifixion on the cross. But Jesus' anchor was his heavenly Father, to whom he was constantly in prayer. And we can read that in Scripture. Jesus knew from eternity that he would leave his safe heavenly harbor, endure trials and temptations, and die for all mankind. He knew that he was not built to remain in the safety of the harbor, even though his harbor was heaven. If we're going to follow in Jesus' footsteps, we're called to do no less. Not that... We're going to live sinless lives and, lives and die on the cross, but we weren't made to stay in our safe little bubble of life. We were made to go out into the world and do. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, Go into the world and preach the gospel to everyone. It doesn't tell us to stay at the congregation we grew up in, to never read our Bible, and to have a faith that sort of sits on a shelf. Matthew 28 and other passages tell us that there is work to be done. The early Christians had a church to build and defend. We have a similar responsibility today. We have a church to maintain and defend. If we're to follow in Jesus' footsteps, we need to get busy. We need to stay busy. Well, that's all great, Troy, but what does that look like? Well, here's how that might look. One, continue to invite people to services. Maybe they say yes, maybe they say no. Invite them to a Bible study. 
or maybe a singing that's coming up or a gospel meeting as well. Who is one person that you can talk to this week about Jesus? Two, who can we serve this week? Let's stay connected with our member care groups and encourage one another. Who's not here? Who's hurting? Many are in need of encouragement. Send an email. Send a text message. Make a phone call. Send a card. Small things like that can make a huge impact. Three, what do we need to defend against this week? Is it apathy? Is it discontentment? Is it a lack of trust? Is it worry? Whatever it is, put on your shield of faith and protect your heart. Keep your sword, which is the word of God, close by and ready to use at a moment's notice. And four, who do we need to care for this week? Is it our spouse? Is it our children? A brother or sister in Christ? While we need to be concerned about people in the world, let's let's also be sure that we're building up and caring for our homes. That's our lesson this morning. Thank you for your attention. And again, I want to thank Brother Lee and the elders for the opportunity to speak to you this morning, and I hope that this lesson has been beneficial to you. But even more importantly, we want to always make sure that we offer an invitation to anyone who needs to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ or maybe who needs the prayers of the congregation. Maybe you've not left that safe harbor. You're still where it's relatively safe. Like we've talked about this morning, that's not what we were built for. We were built to get out there and do. And if you haven't done that, you can become a Christian right now, today, this very hour, so that you can leave that harbor and confidently navigate those difficult seas of life. Or maybe you're a person who's left the harbor. You've been a Christian for many years, a few years, decades, whatever it is. You've been out there on the seas of life and you're battered, you're beat up, you need some care. You need a safe harbor for a little while. This is that time and this is that place. Come down front and we can pray with you, we can pray for you so that you can get back out there renewed and refreshed with the help of your brethren and with the help of the Lord. Ships aren't made for the safe harbor. These things we talked about this morning may be difficult, But remember that God is with you. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are with you. Let's set sail and get to work. If you need to become a Christian this morning, if you need help being a better Christian,